Hi, welcome to a lecture on antennas, and specifically the receive case. In other words, how do antennas receive? Here's the scenario that we're addressing. We have some antenna, and it could be any antenna. I'm just showing it as a dipole here. And there is a wave incident on it. And I'm representing this wave in terms of its electric field intensity. And the question is, what comes out? In other words, in some sense, this is a source for a circuit. How do we model this as a source? Well, the answer is in terms of an equivalent circuit. And here is a Thevenin equivalent circuit, which consists of the open circuit voltage, as usual, and a impedance in series with that voltage source. So this can be a model of uh, this very scenario. So if we can get that open circuit voltage and that series impedance, then we have something that we can use to design radio systems. So first, the impedance. Um, this turns out to be the same impedance that we observe in transmit. In other words, in the transmit case, we were modeling antennas as an impedance, an impedance that was connected to the uh, transmitter, and that impedance was Z sub A. And it turns out that the impedance in series uh, with the uh, antenna source model in the receive case is the same impedance, Z sub A, that we see in the transmit case. You might ask how we know this, and the answer is by reciprocity. So there's a relatively straightforward derivation uh, that one can use to show this. It doesn't really add value to the present uh, discussion to explain exactly how reciprocity works in this case, but is certainly something that's available in, in textbooks, including in my textbook. What about the open circuit voltage? Well, we know that must depend on the incident electric field and it must depend on the antenna geometry. Those are the two things that must determine the open circuit voltage. So, we will present here an ansatz. An ansatz is a proposed solution. And the proposed solution is that the open circuit voltage is the dot product of the electric field intensity vector and some quantity L sub E, which is also a vector. Now, again, here we're presenting it as an ansatz. We can actually derive this, and you can see this derivation in a number of places, including in my textbook. But the derivation really isn't necessary for the present discussion. You simply need to recognize that this is a possibility. In fact, it seems almost certain that this open circuit voltage must be expressible in terms of this expression. So that brings us to the question, what is L sub E? It is vector effective length. That's a, a, a term that we might apply to this uh, quantity. You see right away it has to have units of meters or units of length because electric field intensity has units of volts per meter and open circuit voltage has units of volts. So uh, we call this a length because it has units of meters. Not because it's a physical length, but simply because it has units of meters. It's also clear that the direction, and we'll call that L hat, the unit vector L hat, must represent the polarization of the antenna. Now it doesn't mean it represents the axis of the antenna or any particular fixed geometrical arrangement of the antenna, what it simply means is it must somehow capture the effect of polarization of the antenna on this operation, this dot product. The magnitude of that vector effective length is variously known as effective length, or effective height in some cases, or antenna factor. Those are all basically synonyms, although every once in a while there's subtle distinctions in the definition uh, of those terms. But these are three terms are commonly used. Now, how do we get the effective length? Well, from the definition, we could just say effective length is the open circuit voltage divided by this dot product of the electrical length and the polarization unit vector. Well, that has a couple issues with it, right? One is we have to measure open circuit voltage, and that might be difficult to do to RF. Uh, we have to know what the electric field intensity was in the first place. Perhaps we can arrange that. And then we have to know what L hat is. So the direct measurement can be a little bit tricky. Um, there's a theoretical calculation that's possible. And once again, you can derive that using reciprocity. For the present discussion, I'll simply show you uh, what the result is. And it'll turn out that there's other ways that we can work around this um, uh, for practical work. So for an electrically short dipole, ESD, that's a dipole whose length is much, much less than a wavelength. We find that the vector effective length 
has a vector L hat, which is equal to theta hat, and magnitude L divided by 2. Not surprisingly, it's proportional to L. And then we get this factor of sine theta, which is the same factor we see in the pattern, the power pattern of an electrically short dipole. So none of that is surprising. And uh, that, in fact, is the actual uh, vector effective length of an ESD. Next, let's consider power delivered to the load. And by load, in this case, we usually mean a receiver. Right? So here's our Thevenin equivalent circuit for the antenna, and this works for any antenna. Right? Open circuit voltage equal to the dot product of the instant electric field and the vector effective length. Series impedance equal to the impedance that we see on transmit. And we'll represent the receiver in terms of its input impedance, which we'll call Z sub R. Now we'd also like to define the quantity P sub R. P sub R is the power delivered to the receiver. And uh, we'll note that that's maximized in the particular case that the input impedance of the receiver is equal to the conjugate of the antenna impedance. That's uh, basic circuit theory, right? In other words, if this were any circuit, doesn't have to be an antenna connected to a receiver, it would turn out that power to the load is maximized by making the impedance equal to the conjugate of the source impedance. Right? We refer to that as conjugate matching. And it's no different here. It says that if we want to maximize power delivered to a receiver, we should make the receiver input impedance equal to the conjugate of the antenna impedance. So here's a different perspective. Previously, we were talking about voltages and currents. You know, oftentimes in RF, voltages and currents are hard to work with. And we'd much rather deal directly with power units. And it's going to turn out to be that there's some things we can learn by thinking in terms of power as opposed to voltages and currents. So let's think about the problem in which the antenna is being illuminated by the same radio wave. But in this case, we will describe the radio wave in terms of its power density and specifically copolarized power. That is, the polarization of the incident wave is matched to the uh, antenna so that the polarization is aligned in such a way that we get the maximum power transfer. So I've been calling that power density S super I, I for incident, sub CO, CO for copolarized. And then let's say we want to maximize power. So we'll make the input impedance of this receiver conjugate matched to the antenna. So the input impedance of the receiver is Z sub A conjugate. In that case, we find that P sub R is maximized. So P sub R max is equal to the product of the incident power density and some number. And that number is what's going to represent the antenna. That number we're representing here as the symbol or the variable A sub E. And we see just from this equation that A sub E must be the ratio of the received power under these conditions, copolarized and impedance matched, divided by the incident power density. And we can see from dimensional analysis that that quantity A sub E must have units of meters squared. Now let me emphasize here, this is not a physical area. Right? A dipole can have this quantity, and it's meters squared, but a dipole has no area. A sub E is simply something which has units of meters squared that allows us to use this expression to calculate received power. Nevertheless, since it is something that appears to have units of area, we refer to it as effective aperture. So effective aperture is simply the thing that allows us to convert instant copolarized power density into received power. It tells us the relationship between those two things. Note that uh, the effective aperture must be related to the effective length. And it is. With just a little bit of circuit theory, just based on what I've shown you, it's pretty straightforward to show the relationship between those two things goes like shown in this box, that the effective aperture equals the product of eta, which is the wave impedance, that's 377 ohms in free space, or 120 pi, ohms in free space, times the magnitude of the effective length squared, divided by four times the radiation resistance. Recall radiation resistance is the real part of the impedance of the antenna if you neglect the loss. So that's the relationship between the two. Um, to make this a little bit more real for you, I can do the calculation in terms of an electrically short dipole. 
Electrically short dipole is the one antenna for which we have all these quantities readily at hand. It's relatively simple to analyze. And uh, let's do that. So the effective aperture is wave impedance times effective length. The effective length is L over 2 times sine theta, magnitude squared, divided by 4 times the radiation resistance. And there is the expression for radiation resistance uh, derived elsewhere. So we see the L's cancel. It doesn't depend on length. That's pretty remarkable. The effective aperture of an electrically short dipole does not depend on the length of the dipole. It depends only on the wavelength. You find this whole thing collapses down just to tell you that it's something like a tenth of a wavelength squared times that uh, power uh, pattern factor. So that's pretty remarkable, right? But remember, copolarized and conjugate matched. Those are assumptions that are built into this calculation. Using some very basic principles of thermodynamics, it's possible to derive another relationship which is very helpful and that involves effective aperture. It turns out that if you average effective aperture over all possible directions, that means over all values in theta and phi, then the average turns out to be equal to lambda squared divided by 4 pi, and that's true for any antenna, right? So by applying some very basic principles of thermodynamics, in fact, I show this derivation in my textbook, you can show that the effective aperture averaged all over all directions is equal to this constant. It's proportional to wavelength squared. And this is sometimes referred to as the antenna theorem. It has a grand name here because it's true for any antenna, and it's pretty remarkable. It, this is not really something that uh, is intuitive. Uh, nevertheless, it's true, and it's remarkably simple. So, let me put this in context. Recall that an isotropic antenna is one which, on transmit, radiates the same power density in all directions. So we would expect an isotropic antenna on receive to have the same effective aperture in all directions, which means its effective aperture in any given direction should be equal to its mean effective aperture. So that tells us that the effective aperture of a isotropic antenna is simply lambda squared over 4 pi, again from the antenna theorem, and that's just uh, 0.08 lambda squared. So that's an interesting number because it gives us a baseline. It kind of tells us what the, um, it gives us an effective aperture for an antenna, which is very simple to understand, even if we can't actually implement an isotropic antenna. For any other antenna, that is any practical antenna, the effective aperture is going to vary as a function of theta and phi. So we can take that into account by writing the following expression, a sub e is a function of theta and phi, must be proportional wavelength squared from the antenna theorem, divide by 4 pi, and then we'll put this factor in here to account for the difference. Right? So again, this is an onsatz, but check out what's happening here. That value d is 1 for an isotropic antenna. We just showed that. That's what this previous business was about. Also recall that the directivity of an isotropic antenna is 1. Recall that directivity is really a transmit characterization. It says how much greater the power density is in some direction than the average power density. And once again, we can invoke the idea of reciprocity to show that this quantity d that we're putting in this receive expression here is equal to directivity as we defined it in the transmit case. So for the third time, this idea of reciprocity has been invoked and leads us to the conclusion that a very simple and general relationship between transmit directivity and receive effective aperture is by this expression in the box here. So let us summarize what we have determined here. We have these two quantities, effective aperture and directivity. Directivity we originally obtained as a transmit characterization, and effective aperture we obtained as a receive characterization, but we see that they're related. They're related specifically by this expression that we just uh, alluded to. For this reason, it's pretty common to see directivity also described as a receive parameter, and effective aperture also described as a transmit parameter. So don't be thrown by that. 
Directivity originates as a transmit concept, but reciprocity allows, that to, allows us to use it as a receive concept. So someone can fairly say that the directivity of an electrically short dipole on receive is 1.8 dBi. And what they're really referring to is the fact that directivity and effective aperture are related by this expression. So if you know one, you know the other. Right? And that's the, that's the key idea. That concludes this lecture on the received properties of antennas.